testimonies that I have on tape. And uh, so that's what uh, I'm going to try to do here. The first time uh, we ever came in contact with Brother Bram's meetings was uh, my wife's dad, Harm Werps. Many of you know him. Had heard that there was a man coming to Minneapolis with a healing ministry. So uh, we just lived at about 80 miles from there and just a small church we were attending at that time as Assembly God Church and uh, and uh, so we thought we'd go up for Sunday weekend and, and uh, see what it was all about so we drove up there and uh, I was so uh, I'd never seen anything like it before and uh I hadn't been around. That's before all the big meetings was on and before the big move was on and just uh, 1950. And uh, and uh, I just couldn't get over it, uh, the humility of the man and then to, to use that discernment he had at the, at the end of his service. And we were so impressed that uh, my wife and I, that we had to go back up the next weekend. But being that being it was a small church, the pastor didn't want us to go up there, and he says, we need you here. And I said, well, I said, we're going to go up. He says, well, I'm going to pray that you don't go up. And I said, it won't do you any good, brother. I said, we're going to go up. And uh, so what he did was a, he just closed down his service, and there was that just a few people, maybe 15, 20 in the church, and, uh, and, uh, and he went up. So, but they never, or any of the, the small congregation never say anything about it. And, uh, well, we were, we were, uh, we just couldn't get over it. And, uh, so we went to Brother Bram's meetings there for a few years. We picked up a recorder and got acquainted with, uh, uh, Leo and Gene, uh, through the ma- uh, paper that was put out and, uh, by Gordon Lindsay. And, where the services were being held with Brother Branham, so we attended quite a few of them uh, through the Midwest and went over to Chicago several times, and that's where we got acquainted with uh, Leo and Gene who were making the tapes, and we were ordering the tapes from them. Uh, so we, we, had, uh, we had quite a uh, few of those meetings that we went to, but we went over to... Uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. After the tent, after he announced that he was going to take the tent down Minneapolis, why well, he moved to Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, I had a wholesale candy route, and we just took took our vacation then, and we went over there, went over and uh, went to the meetings over there, and that was where uh, Banks Woods' boy was healed, and that's uh, we have some eight millimeter film on that that my wife had taken over there, and. Uh, uh, that's a lot of the churches have that, and uh, Brother Amalong, Jerry Amalong, and Town East put out a lot of them, and uh, so uh, uh, you could see the picture of the tent and those old cars, 1950, and that it was it's quite a thing when you look back. Anyhow, uh, Brother, uh, first time I really got to see Brother Brand was uh, Brother Fred Sothman, who was a real close friend of mine in the early years and still is. Uh, uh, decided he was going to get to Brother Bram at Prince Albert and asked if he would come, and Brother Bram uh, came. So we went up there. It was in the summer and uh, went to that meeting, and then Brother Fred invited uh, Brother Bram on a fishing trip, and we were privileged to go along with him. And uh, we really had a wonderful time on that fishing trip and caught a lot of fish. And uh, they... Uh, they were uh, real nice. It was walleye pike. They call them pickerel up there, but they uh, they were uh, just. We had a whole tub full. Of them. Some of the pictures that I have out show that, and we had a wonderful time there. But the meetings were just they were real great. And there was had one that had a it had a uh, water head, and they measured it and told them, Brother Bram told him bring it back. Uh, the next night or in a couple of days and, and show how much it went down and it dropped down a, a couple inches, I remember. But there were some great healings in that service, and I'd never seen so many cripples in a meeting as that one there. And that, well, there was just they, uh, so many of them were healed. So we went back home after that and uh, back in Iowa, went to work again, and 
My wife and I got to talking about it. Says, well, if Brother Fred could sponsor a meeting, maybe we could get one, get him to come to Waterloo, Iowa. So uh, we wrote, we wrote back there, and he consented to come. And uh, he sent Lee Vale out a little uh, month or so early to kind of get it set up. You know, get the we rented a hippodrome there, and uh, and uh, he got the platform work set up, and he was to have some afternoon services and uh, get the people ready for Brother Branham and then he, then he came on before Brother Branham ex- and uh, exhorted the people a little bit on the ministry in this meeting is, uh, it, it, Waterloo is a very tough place to be Brother Branham said that uh, that was one of the toughest places he'd ever been in at that time and uh, we didn't have very large crowds. We had about probably about 800, something like that, on the average a night. Uh, but it was in this meeting that uh, that uh, it's on tape that uh, that thunder came down through there, just shook the roof, and the, Brother Branham said he could feel it go by him, you know, on the, uh, past his legs like that, and rattled the, rattled the building. It was a cattle congress building. It had a metal roof on it, and it just rattled it, and. Uh, he, uh, the next night after that happened, he, he explained it. He said it was in, uh, he explained it and he got it out of the scripture. It was in uh, St. John 12, 29, uh, 28 and 29. He says, uh, then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Uh, and the people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. And he used those scriptures there, and oh, a little, he used these couple more here. He said, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And he was, uh, he explained that the next night about Jesus. See, that voice came not, but he says, Jesus believed, to see, but it, co- it, it came for the people there, that uh, it was so hard there, and it was for their sake. Because Brother Branham, he surely believed, you know. Uh, anyhow, uh, then the, we had a breakfast there, as, as usual. They, uh, Brother Lee got uh, some ministers together, and uh, there was only about five five Pentecostal ministers that uh, were there, and the rest were denominational ministers. And uh, they had a... He had a breakfast and uh, for these ministers, and then there was a lot of the a lot of the people from Jeff was there, Banks Woods was there, and and Fred and uh, Tom Simpson and some of the mother there and their families, and uh, so uh, at this breakfast he was he was teaching there and uh, uh, talking about he was not disobedient in the heavenly vision and up up. Uh, a couple ministers got up and walked out, and pretty soon a couple more got up and walked out, and there's about ten of them walked out on them, but he kept right on anyhow. And uh, on one of the tapes after that, he mentions it, I think it was a month or two later that he mentioned it on another tape, I don't know which one it was, but he said that he'd rather deal with a bunch of witch doctors than the than the, those ministers there. That's why uh, he said that place was so hard. And uh, but there was there was uh, some wonderful things done there, like in all of his meetings. So uh, we certainly did appreciate him coming. We had him for ten days, and uh, he uh, he just he did uh, well. They're they're all taped, uh, so you can get them on tape. Tower of Babel, some of them is one of them, and some other ones there. But anyhow. Uh, uh, when we were taking him back after that breakfast, uh, Brother uh, Fred Sothman was in the car and uh, uh, Brother Lee Vale, and uh, I was driving the car and he says, uh, Brother Gene, do you love me? And I didn't answer right quick. He says, Brother Gene, do you love me? And I said, do you want me to prove it, Brother Branham? He says, if I was you, I'd move west. He says, this place is under judgment. So that's what we did. We... Uh, it took me about, I had that little wholesale candy business, and it took us, you know, about six months to get it sold out, and we got rid of it, and we had a household sale, and we just had to pull a little trailer and kept us a few necessities, and we came, and uh, we stopped at Phoenix. We stayed there two weeks, and uh, 
And during this two weeks, why we uh, thought, well, we'll just run down to Nogales and see what it was like down there. And we came, went down there and came back. And of all places, we got off the high and we went up, drove through, come up Speedway, I believe, and, uh, and wound up in Sabina Canyon. And we went past Cloud Road, and we thought that was quite something then, Cloud Road, you know. So uh, we got up there, and it was so nice up there. It was in the rainy season in, uh, in August, and... Uh, and there was water there, and we thought that was so nice, so we decided to come down here. We thought we'd come down and see what it was like here, and we've been here ever since. So when he said west, he didn't say any particular place, but Leo, Leo always kind of thought it might be out around Wickenburg or someplace like that. But anyhow, we, uh, we came here, and uh, we were here five years, uh, then he moved out here. Uh, I'll get into that later. Anyhow, uh, in the time we were here, uh, I hadn't been going to church any place, and, and uh, he told me to find a church home, put the kids in. So we uh, went to Assembly God Church here, and they were put, building a new church, enlarging, and they put a whole new building up, and uh, I was helping them. I wasn't working, so I just went over and volunteered and helped a little bit there. And uh, the pastor, uh, he asked me if he knew that I was going to the meetings up in Phoenix and around, you know. And he, and he says, uh, do you suppose you could get Brother Bram to come for our opening? And I said, why aren't you right? And I right, we'll see what happens. So he, Brother Bram came. We have those two tapes. Brother Fred has them. They, and uh, Tucson here. And uh, he... Uh, he came for the just for Sunday service, and uh, uh, he called out a lot of people. And some of them are the people living in town here, or Tommy Gastel, and some of them they people from uh, Mexico that were called out, and uh, they were healed. And he had he had a real good service here. So uh, they. Uh, They went back then, and uh, and then uh, Brother Bram didn't say anything about coming out here, moving out here at that time, and uh, so uh, I was working for a landscape company, Hoffman Landscape here, and um, and uh, we was doing some tree work in there, and they had a man go up the tr- tree, and I. Uh, he had some uh, a limb roped up there that he was going to leave down, and it got away from him, and it got hung up in a electric light wire. And uh, so he hollered at me to go put a ladder on and get a step ladder over there and get some of them limbs cut off so that he could pull it off the wire. So it was a ten foot uh, step ladder, and I got right on the top rung of it and or step on it. And I was standing up there, and I had a pair of loppers, and I was lopping off some of the limbs. And I didn't know it, but he pulled it up. And when he pulled it up, it swung under the, it swung back and knocked me off the ladder. And I, I went and uh, fell backwards off the ladder. And the week before, they'd pull a bunch of shrubs out of there along the, the uh, brick wall, patio wall, like they have here in Tucson. There, a lot of the yards are walled. And uh, yeah, they left a whole bunch of these uh, cement nails in there where they tie part of canthas, and they'd pulled some of them off. And that, it was in a corner, and there was cement nails all over in that corner. But when I fell, I hit about a foot from the ground, so they tell me anyhow. And uh, yeah, the guy he come down out of the tree scared, I guess. And uh, anyhow, he came down, and and the lady come out, and of course I they, this is just what they've told me, you know, because uh, I just. I passed out. Anyhow, they uh, she come out and and uh, I guess the guy wiped my face with a cloth and uh, wet cloth and uh, then I come to and, and and then I started singing. They said it was a crazy singing something real crazy. You know they couldn't understand and uh, and uh, so I the lady went in the house and called my boss and it wasn't long. He come out and uh, and he. St- uh, he took one look at me, and then I guess he called the ambulance. And uh, so they sent me to the hospital. And 
at that time, it's a Tucson Medical Center here in Tucson. At, at that time, why the, the hospital was full, and they had to put me in the, on a bed in the in the hallway. And uh, but they they said that driver asked me my name, and I give it to him and address and my wife. I, I was in, uh, her name and everything. And uh, so uh, I just come and go. I guess I was in and out. Anyhow, they. When they had me, uh, when they had me in the hallway there, uh, they wouldn't let me have anything to drink. But my wife was giving me a little ice every now and then. I was, was complaining about being so thirsty all the time. And I went in convulsions laying in that bed, and it just scared her. And uh, she hollered for a nurse, and uh, and. They, she said, boy, them nurses tell me later, them nurses was really making tracks around there, and they got me in the emergency room there and got under oxygen. And she went up to the office to call Brother Branham, and uh, they were out shopping. She got a hold of Billy Paul, I guess, and he he notified Brother Branham the, the minute that uh, she he said he'd call, have him call the minute he got in, and which he did. And uh, so he, he talked to... Uh, the operator there in this, and uh, asked uh, for me to get get my wife so he could talk to her. And he said, well, they, we don't have anybody in here by the name of Norman. And uh, he says, well, you must have because she just called from there a little while ago. He's in the emergency. And so he said, no, we don't have, don't have anybody registered. And he so he, she looked it up anyhow, and she says, oh, yeah, there is. And so she got a hold of my wife, and, uh, and my wife talked to Brother Bram about it, you know, and... Uh, so he went into prayer, and later on I was told, but I didn't I didn't know what happened. But anyhow, uh, later on she told me after I come to it that she called Brother Branham, but I didn't know, um, getting a little ahead here now, but to explain it why in the Grass Valley meetings, Banks Woods came up to me and, and he told me, he said that Brother Branham went in his den room and prayed and he said that uh, the angel of the Lord come in there and said that because we stood for him that he'd stand for us. And uh, so that's, I would like to encourage the people right at this point where that have never been in his meetings that don't make any difference whether he ever got in a meeting or not. But if you stand for this word, it'll stand for you as well as it did for me or any, anybody else that was had the privileges that we had of being with him. And so uh, it, it'll it'll work. It it sure will. Anyhow, uh, he talked he uh, talked to my wife and and she came back and then uh, they brought me out of the oxygen off from under oxygen and put me back in the as they did. There was a bed had opened up, so they just. They just pushed me into a room that uh, that I could have a bed, and be in a room, and uh, of course I didn't know I, I I didn't know that I was even being pushed in there. But I, I just came to as they were coming in the door, and I knew I was going to throw up. So I said, "Give me a pan, quick!" And, uh, and I threw up in that pan. It was it was so bloody that it just uh, it, was, it was pretty full. I threw up an awful lot, and it was uh, I just. It was just real, just real bloody. Anyhow, I, from then, from right then, uh, I was I was normal. I uh, I I had headaches, but uh, they took a spinal tap on me. The one of the uh, best doctors in Tucson, brain surgeon, was in there, and he took a spinal tap on me. And I seen the vial, and he held it up, and I seen the vial. And it was just all blood from the in my spine, real cloudy. He said, "We'll take another one on you." Uh, in a couple of days, and he took another one two days later, and it was just clear as clear as spring water. It was just real clear, you know. That's how fast it uh, it left. But I continued to have headaches all the time I was in there, and I was kept hounding the doctor to get out of there because I felt pretty good outside of having some headaches. And he says, "You ain't gonna leave till you get rid of them headaches." So I just wouldn't take any more aspirin and for a couple of days there, and they left me out, and. Uh, but it wasn't long, and I was back to work and felt fine. There's no after effects. And Brother Bram said, told my wife, he said he'd be all right. There wouldn't be anything wrong with him. So then there isn't. 
I'd like to say at that Grass Valley meeting that uh, on a, we had to go, we could only we was the three of the meetings, and there was a uh, there was several more on that series that he was going to. The next one was uh, up in up in Washington, and uh, we went up to say goodbye to him, and uh, and uh, we told him we had to leave, and he says, "Well, he says the." The next meeting, they just have an axe to grind. It was just a one-day meeting. By by that, I don't know what he meant, but that's what he said. So, uh, anyhow, uh, our daughter Mary had she hadn't been sleeping good. Uh, my wife had to lay down with her all the time, at, and uh, for about an hour before she would go to sleep. And what it was was uh, we'd went to church in town here where they'd showed. Uh, those uh, what they did over in Germany with them ovens and that and and uh, they had it in a church and we didn't know you know and but anyhow that uh, that is what upset her um, and my my wife told Brother Branham that she she had to lay down you know in order for her to get to sleep so uh, he just laid his hands on her and just said a little prayer you know and he and then uh, when he got done praying he says. Uh, uh, you know, he says, uh, well, remember, he didn't say this, but he, you remember that time that that bat, and Brother Bram talks about that bat in that door, that drunk guy coming, ruined, real early in Brother Bram's minute, he said he seen a bat go through there and the door went to swinging. Well, he said he seen over Mary, it was like a buffalo head. And uh, it was a spirit, and it just kept buffaloing her. That's why she couldn't get to sleep. But... After he prayed for her, she and my wife never had to lay down with her after that because that left. He seen it leave. He said it left. You know, it was just like it was just buffling her. Uh, so I thought I would I'd get, get back and tell you on that. Anyhow, uh, then uh, we went to uh, Shreveport meeting, the last meetings he had there in uh, in uh, 62, the fall of 62. And uh, he invited us out for dinner there, and he told us to, when we went back to, to find him a home that he was coming to Tucson, and that's the first I know that he was ever even going to be in Tucson, and uh, because he had never said where. And uh, anyhow, uh, we we found a place for him, and. Uh, he wanted us to stay in the worst way in his room that night and not leave. We was going to leave, start back at night for Tucson, and he didn't want us to leave. He wanted to stay there. And what it was, we only got part way. Not we didn't even get out of town in the in the bearing, uh, universal bearing, in the, in the Ford went out, went to thumping, and we couldn't. We just pulled behind the station. Woke up the next morning. It was right across from the wrecking yard. Drove it over there, and and the guy put a new bearing, and and it was on our way. But he tried in the worst way for us to stay there, but we wouldn't impose on him like that. So, but he was always so gracious. Brother Bram was always never missed a chance to try to do something for you, and was always, always just so such a wonderful spirit, you know. Uh, he and when we were in the room, he wanted to know if, if we, he want he wanted to ask us if he should go through that prayer line and tell us what happened again and we said no we wouldn't we wouldn't make him do that you know but we knew he could do it we knew he could do it but that was i that was sure something he asked us we wanted him to uh but anyhow he came in the first part of january in six in 63 and the, when he first come to our apartment little apartment we had there why he came for the key and i'll never forget it you know my wife she always reminds us of it and tells people about it, how that uh, when he came there, he stood like a fighter's feet apart like, and he says, stood there just so, I, I can't explain how he looked, but he says, something's fixing to happen. And uh, I didn't know what it was, and I just I wouldn't have had any idea, you know. And uh, anyhow, what it was was... A couple of months later, that's when the seal was open, see, up at sunset. But we got the key for him. We got the little place for him. That's where he moved over to Elf Larson's house, and uh, he rented, had that rented for the, till the summer there anyhow. And uh, so uh, 
then I had the privilege of going up the hunting window. I'm up there with Brother Fred. And, uh, of course, that's on tape in several places there. And uh, uh, it was started the night before. He was uh, talking to Fred and I, and just before dark, a couple hours before dark, we was going to go out and... Uh, and uh, it was just around the corner from where the main camp is and where the whirlwind come down. We had our woos camp right there along that little jeep trail there. And uh, there was a little canyon that went up back up in there. And, and and he was talking to us there and telling us some things. And uh, finally he shouldered his gun and he says... Um, when he said, oh, what it was, I was praying for my daughter. Let's go back a little bit. I was praying for my daughter and uh, my oldest daughter. And uh, when before he left, when he started talking, he looked at me and he says, Gene, he says, uh, I didn't know you was out there praying for your daughter. And I said, yes, Brother Branham. And uh, he says, uh, well, it's going to be all right. He says, I see a light above her. So he says, it's going to be all right. He was telling us some things there, and then uh, he shouldered his gun. He says, and he held his two hands out, and he says, "Do you think when visions come like this here that they don't bother?" And his hands was just trembling. And uh, he says, uh, "We'll hunt a while." Then he says, we'll, be, "We'll we'll have a little lunch. We'll come back at dark after dark." He says. So I went around the corner from the camp. And Fred, he went up, I think he went up the main wash, and I went around back of him and, and was going to hunt the, that wall or up right above where the world wouldn't come back. I was back up in there. And uh, I had just got around that corner just a little ways, and I sat down, and I never wept like that in my life, and I wasn't thinking about anything. I wasn't thinking about my daughter. He said, everything is going to be all right. And uh, I just wept and wept and wept. And the, when I got done, I was just real drained, you might say, tired. So I got up and walked, and uh, I got up uh, around uh, up on top there, and I could see his, be before that happened, I could see him going up that, what he called that hog back up there by that pine tree up on top there, and, up, and he went right in the direction where that's, that blast was the next morning. So I went around the back, and I went up around, uh, up on top up there, and I'd hunted about an hour, and I sat down, and the same thing came on me. I just sat down and wept. I didn't, I didn't even know why I was weeping or what happened. And uh, anyhow, we all got back in there about dark, and we didn't see any pig. But the next morning, he had us to go up there where he'd went the night before. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of the brothers know just where it's at, so it's... it's we went up that direction up there and went up there, and he separated us. And uh, and so he was hunting to the right, and Fred was hunting in the middle, and I walked down the Rattlesnake Mesa Road, and I was hunting, and I hunted downhill. I went down into the bottom, and I got down in the bottom, and that happened to me again. That was three times. And I just sat down and wept and wept and wept. And when that passed away, I got up and I hunted about a, I started working back, and I hunted, a, oh, probably about a half an hour, and that blast went off. And it, it sounded like it was just right above my head. And uh, I looked up, and uh, I didn't, I didn't see nothing. Uh, you know, I did, I seen something. I didn't see it, the cloud in the form that it shows in the picture. When I looked up, I seen two long streaks of, of uh, like a. A plane, you know, leaving a trail, two streaks with a great miles one way and miles the other with a spot in be with a big spot in a space in between it, and uh, but I couldn't see no planes. I thought what I thought what it was probably a plane bust the sound barriers, but there was no planes in the area, and, and there was and there just wasn't any there, you know, and I didn't know what it was, and so I started hunting back up the hill up there, and uh, I met. Fred and Brother Bran, they were sitting on the uh, Rattlesnake Mesa Road on top. They were waiting for me. And uh, first thing Brother Bran asked me when I got on top, he says, Gene, he says, uh, did you hear that noise? And I says, man, Brother Bran, I says, I've been out here five years. And I says, I have never heard a sound like that in town, out of town, or any place. But he didn't say anything. And... Uh, 
Fred and I walking back. I said, man, wasn't that a blast? And he said, yeah. He said, could be something to it. So uh, we got back to camp there, and Brother Branham uh, said, well, he said, well, he'd put a piece of paper up there on a on a bush. He says, we'll come back and try. Five years, and I said, I have never heard a sound like that in town, out of town, or any place. But he didn't say anything. And... Uh, Fred and I walking back. I said, man, wasn't that a blast? And he said, yeah. He said, it could be something to it. So uh, we got back to camp there, and Brother Branham uh, said, well, he said, well, he'd put a piece of paper up there on a, on a bush. He says, we'll come back and try it. And he says, if we don't, uh, if they're not in there, he says, well, we'll go back. So we went up there the next morning and tried it, and... Uh, they weren't in there. And uh, he'd draw a little map, and he'd give it to me and, and show us we get right, he's put right where that piece of paper was so we get out on the right finger, you know, and he positioned me to where I could scare him over to Fred. Fred hadn't got his pig, and, uh, and uh, so we've, that's where he positioned us, but there was nothing happened, so he said, well, he was going to go back and... Uh, Few days later, I had the privilege of then of going back to uh, ride, ride back with him to uh, when he preached the seal. So he come picked me up, and Fred Sothman and Tom Simpson they had cars, and Billy Paul they were we had quite a convoy there. So anyhow, I got to ride with him, and uh, and uh, I says uh, he said, "Well, we'll eat we'll eat breakfast in Benson," and I says, "Well, I don't I don't know if I'll be able to eat breakfast or not." I said, "I had too much." Pork last night, and I said I was up a couple times in the, in the night, and I said I don't know. He says, "Well, we'll stop there." And uh, uh, and anyhow, he says, uh, "What do you?" He done went. And he, he, you'd think he was listening to medical doctor because he went right in to explain what happened on my insides. Uh, got too much of that rich, you know, stuff that grease and upset my stomach. And the way he explained it, you'd think he was listening to medical doctor. But he, he when we got to Benson, I had breakfast. It was all right. So, uh, anyhow, uh, uh, we got back to Jeff there, and uh, I got to stay with Brother Beeler and Brother Palmer at Brother Beeler's house and had a good fellowship with them. And uh, I like to say that, uh, uh, to me, them, them seals are so outstanding. And I, I thought I was getting a lot then, but I, I tell you, I wasn't even scratching the surface. And I, but they, to me, they're just so wonderful. Uh but on the, he, uh, I think that uh, it took more out of him on those seals than people really really know, and uh, I could see that. And he was so nervous that uh, uh, we got into Arizona. He started singing, and he sang, I don't know, maybe two, three hours. He'd say, would well, you know this one, Gene? He was trying to pull himself out of it, and uh, uh, he just, uh, he was, Really, just t- took an awful lot out of what I could see. And the next day, I went over to Moe's backyard and taking care of the place for him there. And uh, I walked around the back of the house in the morning. Here he was hunched up against the house back there, and uh, there was a kind of a—he was just beside himself, I guess. Uh, anyhow, he said, "Don't, don't, uh, don't tell that guy across the street." There was a kind of an odd character that used to bother him. You know, he says, "Don't tell him I'm here, Gene." He says, "I just want to be alone." So I got around the front, went out there and mowed, and and, uh, and I got out of there as quick as I could. Uh, he went back in the house, I guess, by the time I got the backyard, because uh, I didn't, I wouldn't bother him for anything. And so uh, it uh, it really drained him. And uh, I was over to my brother-in-law Willard Wirtz's, uh, and he got a phone call, and I'd picked up that Life magazine. And uh, I was summing through there, and I seen that cloud picture, and I didn't have any idea what it was. And uh, so I asked Willard, I says, don't you think that's strange? He says, it sure is. I says, I think, I says, can I just take this and show Brother Branham? And he says, sure, you can have it if you want it. So Brother Branham come over Sunday to, 
uh, go to church down to uh, one of the Assembly of God churches on Broadway, and uh, I, I showed him that picture of the cloud, and I said, did you ever see this before, Brother Branham? He says, uh, this picture? And he says, no. I says, I haven't seen it. And, uh, and he looked at it. He says, I guess you know that... Uh, it's in the form of seen it was in the form of a pyramid and I says no I never I says do you mind if I have it Gene I said no take it along I don't want it and he never said what it was and uh, but later on then when it, when he uh, he said what it was why uh, uh, we were going to church another Sunday morning he says uh, Gene he says why don't you go down and tell that McDonald he's the guy at the university there that uh, was uh, making light of it you know and uh, and uh, he said, why don't you go down and tell him just what happened up there? I says, not me, Brother Branham. I says, I'd get it all balled up. I says, you go tell him. But he says, well, he says, uh, it was. it's not for them. He says, it's for us that believe. And I think it was a year and a half or two years later, that man took his own life. Now, that's that's uh, the difference. If you stand, If you stand for the word, if you go against the word, that's quite a contrast. He took his own life. And, and talk about going against the word. I'd like to give you a, a one on hunting. Uh, Brother Bram and I was out hunting one, quail hunting one morning, and uh, and it was up uh, north here, uh, and uh, about 40 miles out of town. And he went over a fence first, and I went over right behind him. And when I jumped off behind him. He was off to my right a little ways, and when I jumped, I hit a, uh, about an inch stub of a root, and I turned my ankle. And uh, when I... that I, I felt pain in my life, but I've, ne- I've never felt pain like that there. And uh, and I, I reached down, I grabbed my ankle, and I, was, and I had this hole in my ankle, and he turned around and looked, and he came over real fast, and he says, Gene, lay down. And I laid down, and he laid his hand on that ankle, and it felt like something warm come over. He was saying he said a little prayer. And what he said, he just he says that he prayed that it wouldn't be broke, that my ankle wouldn't be broke. And uh, it's just a short little simple prayer. And and he says uh, you're going to have a sore ankle for a couple of weeks or so, sore foot. He says for a couple of weeks. He says I'll go back and get the jeep. And I says. Oh, Brother Bram, look, there's quail. There was a mud tank there, and there was water, and there was quail running all over there. I said, look at the quail over there. I said, go get them. He says, no, Gene. He says, I'll take you in. He wouldn't, he wouldn't go hunt them quail, you know. So that's how gracious he was all the time. He was more concerned about getting me back to town, and he knew I was all right. But So he says, I'll help you over the fence. And so, oh, I said, I can make it. No, he says, I'll, I'll help you. So he got help me over the fence, and then he had me to put my arm up around his shoulder, and I could walk on that ankle. But uh, he says, I'll just help you the Jeep. And, uh, so, uh, But before that, I forgot, I, I was, when he went to get the Jeep, after he'd prayed for me, I, I felt like uh, I was just like getting real seasick. You know, I was getting sick to my stomach, and I felt like I was going to throw up, and I, I quick laid down, laid on my back, and I quick laid down, and that passed away. And then when I then I sat up against the post there and waiting for him, and then uh, uh, it got come on me again. I thought, man, I'm gonna quick lay down. I don't want to throw up, you know. Maybe I'll go away again, and it, it went away again. And it, that happened three times there. I was just up and down, up and down, up and down. So when he when he come back over the fence, to get, he said, uh, I said, uh, brother Bram, I says, you know, I thought I was gonna throw up three or four. Times there, I said I had to lay down. I'd get up and I'd lay down. And here he is again. He explained. He says all them nerves in your in your your feet run up your legs up and past and past your stomach. He says and that's what made that made that feel that way. He knew just exactly what what it was, you know. And he told me what it said. That's what it was. So uh, anyhow, I drove back and uh, and. Next day, I went to work for Tony. I was working in sporting goods store there, Tony Stromey, and uh, and uh, I could get around. And uh, he says, "What are you doing here?" And I says, "Well, I come to work." He says, "Well, I thought you got hurt." And I says, "Yeah." I says, "I did." I says, "But Brother Brian prayer for me." I says, "I'm all right." And so he's a little gruff. He says, "Oh." <laughs> Another time, we went out quail hunting, and uh, there was uh, several of the brothers. Uh, Welch Evans and some of his boys and oh, I don't know there was 
there was six or eight of us, so we were we were out in the Willow Springs area, ranch out area up there, and we stopped for we had dinner, so we all pulled up together, you know, and, uh, and sitting there eating our lunch. And before I left, uh, Sister Nadine Wirt, Donnie Wirt's wife, uh, uh, she was complaining about not feeling good, so she sent a handkerchief along with me, and she wanted Brother Bram to pray over it. So after we got all done eating, uh, I thought, well, now this is a good time. Everybody's getting their guns and putting their sacks away and this and that, you know, and they're getting their shells. And So I walked over to Brother Bram, and I said, Brother Bram, I said, Sister Nadine wanted you to pray over this hanky. And just as I had noticed, no sooner said that and handed him that hanky. Now, listen, he didn't have to get down on his knees and pray for vision. I just got, he just got that hanky, and he says, yes, he says, I see her standing in the wind. And he says that the water she's drinking, is, is uh, that, the, that's what's bothering her. She was standing in the wind, and the dust, it was a dust allergy, and the water that she was drinking, that's what was bothering her. And he said a little prayer over the hanky and handed it back to me. And uh, that that he showed us that uh, all the brothers that card of that Bishop Stanley, you know, that uh, this day the scripture must be fulfilled. And uh, he he when that happened in Phoenix, and then, and he got that uh, Bishop Stanley's card with all them titles on it, and he was showing us that before we got back hunting. In the beginning, I said, if you stand for this message, it'll stand for you. But then if, if you don't, then something can happen too. And there's, there's many testimonies on that. But Brother Bram and I was fishing uh, down at Penablanca Lake. That's uh, just north of Nogales here, about 15, 20 miles. And uh, uh, we was just fishing a little sunfish. And uh, so he says, it was about noon. He says, Gene, he says, let's go up and get a hamburger at the lodge up here. And I says, okay. He said, we'll just leave our lines way in the water. I said, okay. So we went up, got a ham- hamburger, and we come back down, and here's a game warden sitting in his boat waiting for us. So uh, he, he asked us for our licenses, and uh, Brother Bram got his out first and gave it to him, and he, so he got out his book and started writing. He was writing a ticket, and Brother Bram says, uh, well, uh, what's, what's, the vi- what are, what's the violation? And he says, uh, well, he says you left your lines unattended. He says uh, it's in the laws that you're not, you're not supposed to leave it unattended, leave it lay in the water like that, and not have it attended. And he says, Gene, uh, he says, well, here is Gene Norman. He works for uh, uh, Field and Stream Sporting Goods. He says, uh, is that in the law? Is that in the law there, Gene? He says, well, I said, I, I never heard of it. And, and the game warden said, well, it's there. And he's very arrogant about it. And uh, so Brother Bam started talking talking to him, you know, and he says about how he used to be a game warden, and, and, and you know, kept talking to him like that there, and about how he used to deal with people. The guy just kept writing. He says, where's your license? And I handed it to him. And he, so he uh, he wrote me one, and he says, well, he says, another man was talking to him all this time, and in my heart I was thinking, I wonder why he just, what, why he's doing that, why don't he, why don't he just let him write the tickets, and we'll go pay the, pay the fine and get it, you know. But he was dealing with him, see, and he wouldn't, uh, the guy would just wouldn't, you know, uh, he's very arrogant. So anyhow, uh, he wrote the tickets, and uh, he says, well, he says, you have to go to court on a Monday, and uh, uh, it was a day that I couldn't get there, and I think it was a Monday or Tuesday, and he says, the court will be open, you can pay the fine. And I says, this is Thursday, this is the day I have off, couldn't we just go in and pay it today? And uh, I says, how much would it be? And he says, oh, I don't know what it'll be. But he says, I don't know if there's anybody there. I says, well, could you give us the directions? And so he gives us the directions in the Nogales and uh, where we could find the courthouse. And we, we, we went, and uh, on, the, on the way, Brother Ben was, brought that up, and I could tell it bothered him real bad, you know. He brought it up about that guy writing that ticket. So uh, we found a place, and there was a lady there, and... and uh, and she says, yeah, it would be all right to pay it. So we paid the fine and uh, come back, and uh, I think it was $10 a piece, something like that. At that time, that was quite a bit of money. And uh, so anyhow, uh, we was coming back, and coming back, he says, uh, do you feel like fishing? And 
I, I knew he did. He had a little, he'd mentioned maybe going varmint hunting in the evening, you know, and I says, and I didn't care to, after that, so I said, no, I said, I don't want to, I, I says, if you want to hunt, well, go ahead. And uh, So he says, we'll go down by Ruby. It's a little old mining place. It's closed up down there. And uh, he says, maybe we, maybe I can call in a cat. And so uh, that's what he tried. He tried to call in any he told me where to sit someplace so that I'd be away from him, you know, and I kind of will keep my eyes open. And he went calling a little ways off another direction. And, but nothing came in, so he says, uh, well, he says, this road goes down the Aravac and then comes out on the highway. And I says, yeah. And I says, uh, well, he says, why don't we just take this gravel road? And on that gravel road, he brought it up again, you know, about that game war. And I says, well, he says, maybe the, maybe the guy gets a cut out of the fines or something. Maybe his kids need to get some new shoes or something, you know, and he gets so much for writing a ticket or something like that. But I could tell that didn't go over very good. I, I just, you know, I was, so uh, anyhow, uh, I think it was about a year and a half or two later. I think it was close to just over a year, I think, later. I'd picked up a newspaper here. I read in there with this game warden. They'd found him dead down by the border in a 357 Magnum lay on the seat and he had powder burns on his forehead. So it don't it don't pay. You know, sometimes it happens right now and sometimes it happens later. So it, it, it just, that spirit, you know, just uh, didn't, didn't grieve. It just, it just grieved too bad, I guess. So that's what happened anyhow. I was cleaning out my drawer uh, the other night and uh, I come across a letter that was stuck way in the back, and I'd throw a bun- bunch of old stuff out of my drawer and cleaning the house, and this was stuck way back in the corner, and I'd forgot all about it. But uh, I got a letter from a brother in uh, Australia, and the date on it is it's A.F. O'Dwyer, and it's uh, January 29th, 1976. During the past few weeks, I listened again to the testimony tape you so thoughtfully made. On the tape, I heard your testimony about the time you fell off the ladder and had to go to the hospital, and how the Lord healed you, and how that as you had stood for Brother Branham, he had stood for you. Shortly after this, one of my sons, Andrew, age nine, became sick and had to go to the hospital. I got up in the middle of the night to pray and remember your testimony. It encouraged me quite a bit. So I asked the Lord if he would undertake for my son, as I had done my best to stand true to this message, just as he stood for you because you had stood for his prophet. Two days later, my son came home from the hospital without having the operation, which seemed so important a few days earlier. I was really grateful to the Lord for healing my boy and thought it good to pass on to you what your t- testimony had done. Now that that's uh, what I said in the beginning about standing for the word. If you stand for the word, here's a man clean across over in Australia, never been in a meeting, and, and uh, he took a testimony for himself uh, because it works for him as well as it works for me or anybody else. Just because you, uh, we had the privileges that we had here, and he didn't. He still is believing. Saying there's just a little group there, and uh, and uh, they get very lonely at times. He said in his letter, and uh, they look for the coming of the Lord, and it's like we do. And we, I just think we're we're so close now that, uh, but it's so it. I thought it was of the Lord to put that on because I'd, I'd forgot all about this letter and I didn't even know it was in the drawer. This is in 1976 and uh, it uh, it encouraged me when I read that to uh, uh, put it on the tape for a testimony. And I just I thank the Lord for that because it's 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 Him anyhow. It isn't us. There isn't one of us anything anyhow outside of Him. And it's just there ain't no no one above the other in this. We're all just Christians and and. And look, look to Him, and we know our healing comes from Him. And whatever we get, we can, we owe to Him. The greatest privilege we have is that is this is this word that we're we're allowed to to hear now, which maybe someday we won't be allowed to hear. So it's 
good thing to get filled up on it because there, there's so much in there that uh, there's just no end. It's just beautiful. The last hunt that we were on uh, was about a month before Brother Branham passed away. He was up at North Kaibab hunting deer up there. And uh, it was that night and we were at the campfire there and Brother Branham got out a bottle of alcohol and uh, rubbing alcohol and he was rubbing his ankle. And uh, he said, Gene, he says, remember the time you hurt your ankle? And I said, yeah. He says, see, he says, uh, the gift isn't for me. He said, I have to rub mine with alcohol. He had jumped off his truck uh, during the summer there and it had turned his ankle and off the, and he'd, he'd been rubbing alcohol on it and that had been quite a while since he had done that and, uh, he was still, it was still hurting him and bothering him. He said the gift wasn't for him, but it was for you people. Billy Call was real sick that night. I remember he was he went down a little trailer and was walked out there. He and I believe Brother Bram prayed for him because when he come back, he was he was feeling a lot better than when he left. So it's just those things that you when you think the the life that he lived and how he put his life out to other people all the time and did everything that he could for them. It uh Always, always there, willing to help, you know, whatever, and it just, uh, but still, all the trials that they had in the meetings and everything, all the pushing, the tugging, and this and that, and, and, uh, it just, uh, physical. He went through an awful lot to deliver this word to us. So it behooves us to really appreciate this word, and I know of things he's went through, why it, uh, uh, I know I get lax in it sometimes myself. I'm ashamed to say it, but I, I could put more time in it, and I, I'm, I intend to do that. It's just uh, there is so much there. Just uh, he's left us so much, so much of the true word that it it uh, it's food for our soul. That's all. It, there's nothing else. It's just so wonderful. We're a privileged people to have what we have and to have as much that we have. It, it, I would like to close this tape uh, by reading a quote from Brother Branham. He says, My motive is to know his word and to please God by serving him by his word. You can only serve God on earth as God's servants that sent on earth by divine inspiration interprets the word to you. Do not let this word ever depart from your ears and your heart. Father God, it is the greatest privilege a moral ever had was to close his eyes and to open his heart and to speak to you. And we know that you hear if we could just believe that you hear. And may those that hear this tape receive strength and courage. For what has been spoken is a witness of the resurrected Christ and a very, very small part of what he has done in this closing hour of time. God bless you.